Well, good morning. We are here today and we are sharing um, a woman's heart, God's dwelling place. Today we're going to be studying about the ark, um, which was directed by God. And it's very interesting how everything is set up very, very specifically. So as we're going through this, um, there were several things that the, that the Lord had brought to my mind. And, you know, I, I kind of I wrote this down this morning. And it says, think about what you're thinking about as we go through this. Because, you know, as we're talking about the tabernacle, the tabernacle, the ark, the chest of the ark that they were told to create. But the difference being, as they were doing that, you know, we know that our tabernacle, we are the Holy, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We are the temple. Our bodies are a temple of God. And so as I was thinking about that, I thought, well, okay, so let's find out where this link is going to go. And so these are some of the things that I just wanted to kind of reflect on today. Think about what you're thinking about. Are you caught up in the mass of politics and the lies and the uh, discouragement or the inaccuracy that's portrayed in our news? the wars, or the rumors of war, earthquakes in Afghanistan. You know, there's been all kinds of earthquakes coming through. Oh my goodness. Um, and I, and it's, it's very easy to become overwhelmed with what is happening in our situation, what's happening in the world. And today what I want to do is I want to just focus on God. God holds our future. You know, God holds our future, and I want to be able to seek him with all of our heart and all our soul and all our mind. And so today, as we go through and we're kind of looking at this, it talks about reading Exodus 25 through 31, and that's going to be kind of the basis of our, our study this morning. This is a Beth Moore study. And so as we go through those those scriptures in 25 to 31, we're going to find um, some very, very specific directions that God had for his people. And so we're not going to read it all um, verse by verse, but we're going to hit on some very um, distinguished scriptures in this. So the first one it's talked, the first question that we have is what is the first piece of the furniture of God that God instructed Moses to make in Exodus 25, 10? So what did God instruct Moses to make in and ten chest. Yes, what was it? it was called a chest, the ark. That we call it the ark, um, and we know that the ark is a tabernacle. I just want to read a little bit about, and so you can get a taste of what this is about, because this is what God specifically told them to do: have them make a chest of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both on the inside and the out. Make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it to fasten them to its four feet with the two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make a pole of acacia wood and overlay it with gold. Insert the poles inside of the rings on the sides of the chest to carry. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. Then put the ark in the test, the ark, the testimony, excuse me. Then put in the ark, the testimony, which I will give you. Okay, so what they're asking, he was asking uh, Moses to do is to put the, to build like a, an altar, and this was a carrying altar because this was during the time that they were in the wilderness. And so they would have to use the poles that were all gold. So can you imagine how beautiful that is? Oh my all goodness. Gold. All gold like that? Wow, that's amazing. Well, see, they had to use the poles because they couldn't touch the ark. That's exactly right. Because it, later on, it will tell God will say, you are not to touch. It's a holy place. And you're not to touch it. Um, and that wasn't, and so that was just trying to teach them the respect that they needed. In Exodus 27, 9 through 19, it's talking about the details of what 
the actual area was like, the courtyard. What was the courtyard like? And so let's look at Exodus 27, 19. All the other articles used in the service of the tabernacle were ever their function, including at the tent pegs for it and those for the courtyard are, are to be bronze. Yes. Okay, so again, now, and it was supposed to be, the courtyard was supposed to be 100 cubits um, long on the north and south sides and 50 cubits on the east and the west side. Okay, so, you know, as I, as I was going through this study, I, I kept wondering, well, why are we studying the tabernacle? It's the north side. Why are we studying the tabernacle? Why is it so important? Because, I mean, there's many books that talk about the tabernacle and the building of the tabernacle and the, the um, specific ways that the tabernacle needs to be treated and, and what they're going to do when they arrive at the tabernacle. And I thought, why are we studying the tabernacle? And then I read this verse in 1 Corinthians six nineteen, and it says, Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with the price. Therefore, honor God with your own bodies. And that's why we're studying this. For we are the temple of God. And so as we look at this tabernacle, this picture of a tabernacle, and I think of the goal, and I think of the trials that sometimes we go through, and it's those trials that we go through, that gold has to be purified like fire, by fire. And it's the trials in our life that purify us and make us like gold. Right, the purification. The purification, yes. Okay, so in our in our study, they have us to um, draw a picture of the actual um, tabernacle, the, the outside where everything is placed. And I don't know, I'm going to see if you can see this. I'll have to take a picture of this next week. But in my study Bible, I'm going to do this so you can see it. There is a picture of, this is the tabernacle. And that's what we're studying right now. This is the entire area. And so this is the courtyard. And so we were to draw a picture of that. Um, and then as we go through this, we'll see... Um, why this is so important. Okay. When, when I worked at the Holy Land, they had set up just like that. Mm, the Holy Land. Yes. And they had like productions that they did two or three times a day. Oh. For the, that it showed the whole, the whole thing. Awesome. Oh, it that's was, amazing. That was so I'm educational. I'm all discombobulated. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. Um, and so um, it talks about even as... Even as detailed, and we're going to kind of skip some of this, but they had 20 posts on every, in the front of it. Um, and they had 10 on the sides. On each side. On each side. Yeah. And everything was very specific and represented an aspect of their lives. And that's why they did that. Exodus 27, 12 to 16. Let's look at 27, 12 to 16. I think we may have picked up some of that. On the west end of the courtyard shall be 50 cubits, 50 cubits wide and have curtains with 10 posts and 10 bases. On the east end, towards the sunrise, the courtyard shall be 50 cubits wide, curtains at the entrance and three posts and three bases, and the curtains 15 cubits long, are to be on the other side with the post and three bases. For the entrance to the courtyard provides a curtain 20 cubits long of blue, purple, scarlet yarn, finely twisted linen, and the work of an embroiderer, all with the four post and four bases. So we, what we see here is we see that not only is this something that God has designed for them to do, 
but it's very specific and it's ornate. It is, I mean, if you had a study of the Holy Lands and you did, they had a representation. And even in, this is kind of sounds funny, but in um, the, one of the um, movies, there's several movies that they actually represent this because it is so identifiable because we've been given very specific ways to do that. Even when I was teaching at art, um, in a Christian school years and years and years ago, one of the one of the final projects that I did was to choose one of the artisans that's in the book of Exodus and begin to do choose a project that you could do because there are so many artisans. God has very specific purpose for each and every one of our lives. And that's what that's what this is really about is this specificness that God has here. So here it says, let's discover why God chose the east for one of his entrances. If you read in Genesis 3, 24, what place was designed for God to fellowship with his people that also had an eastern entrance? Okay, after mm -hmm. he the man mm -hmm. out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden, cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way of the tree of life. Okay, so all the way back to Genesis, God had specifically set up when he was first, when, when he first created man and woman. Don't you think that that east side has a lot of significance? Yes, absolutely. And doesn't that just come out and like he's coming back? Yes, eastern sky from the eastern sky right. he is coming back from the eastern sky and i think that <coughs> there is much more even about that eastern sky that is so important um and we're going to look at some of those things but here you know that was where you know it that in the garden of eden god created man and woman and he created them to live in the land of in the garden in a perfect world, a perfect life. Yeah, they had everything. They had they everything had. they wanted. Yes. And yet... That was Jehovah Jireh. He that was Jehovah everything. Jireh. He provided everything. Yet there was a fall. And when they fell, God said, I have to have a new plan. I'm going to send my son Jesus, and he's going to forgive you for your sins. But in the meantime, before Jesus comes, I'm going to be setting up the tabernacle and doing all of this. But... When he cast them back out of the Garden of Eden, he put an angel of protection there to protect the tree of life. And wouldn't it be amazing to find that Garden of Eden here on earth? Because it's still here. It was a real place. Yeah. wasn't. Um, well, in God's time, man will discover that. Absolutely. In God's timing, we will discover that. <clears throat> so what place was designed for God to fellowship? That was in the Garden of Eden. And what were there? What were on that east entrance that protected the doors? Okay, it says... The cherubim. Cherubim. Yes, the cherubim. Flaming, what is it? Yep. Flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way of the tree. Of yes, us. yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So it was protection. It was for protection. And Matthew 2, 9 and 2 and 9... Um, and we know this, we won't go there today, but what did the Magi come for? Why did the Magi come? The three wise men, they came to visit Jesus. Why? He, to, came, he, he came to to proclaim. Yes, they came to worship Jesus. The three wise men came from, um, came from, following the eastern star right. and when that star was up there they followed that star so that they could go and worship the baby jesus right. Right. and we'll look at that you know when we get back to christmas coming in we'll see all that um psalm 30 and 5 let's go to psalm 30 and 5 30 verse 5 30 verse 5. Okay. 
says, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that that's interesting because in the morning, what, what sky does the morning sky come up? The in morning the sun comes up right. in the east. Right. Yes. And so um, I love that my home, my my um, front window, my area where I do my devotions and I pray, right is in the east, faces the eastern I sky. This morning, sitting there in the sun. Yes. Just... Yes. And it's always so amazing. And actually, yesterday I was able to see three live deer come right across that. So that was just such a blessing from God. Um, and then in Exodus 27 16, we read this before. What did it, do you remember what it said about the special requirements for the gate? What did we hang on them? Okay, Exodus 20. What? Exodus 27. Okay, that's good. And that's verse 16 on the entrance to the courtyard. Provided a curtain 20 cubits long, a blue, purple, scarlet yarn, and finely twisted linen, the work of an embroider which with four posts and four bases. Yes. So that was, again, a very specifically laid out plan that God had for them. Okay. It had color hangings of curtains. The gate was to be embroidered with blue and purple and scarlet. The beautifully expressive hues, as we study in week three, was to identify God's glory. Oh, that's like the Holy Land that was just beautiful with all the colors. And, yes. And it was just, yes. it was perfectly laid out. It was, it, well, it's, we have such a great plan. I wish I would have uh, been there. That would have been a great representation. Oh, it was wonderful. My, wonderful. is it still available to visit? I don't think so. Oh, okay. I, I think when, when the, uh, the other, the people took it over, uh, <clears throat> Went and put it more televised and more, you know. Uh, okay, so it kind of lost some things with yes. that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't even. I what a great! It, that would be a great theme park, wouldn't it? Be a great theme park. Yeah, the Bible, well, see, that, a Bible, the walk it, through the Bible. Yeah, well, that's what it was. But know? I think um, the Gen it, not Genesis. Well, they made it a theme park, and that's not mm, what it was designed right, to be. Right. Right. Uh, right. I, it was such a blessing to me, and, and that was a good. That was, but see, God had a purpose for you to do that, to be able well, to have that, and to be able to focus on that, on His blessings. That was Thomas. He was just that. He grew so much because we we left a church uh -huh. that was that was just crumbling, mm. and he was just he was so. And now Tom is in the glory and we know that heaven has every single color of the rainbow and every single color and every single stone. The growth that I saw. That in, yes, yes, amen, amen. That was what drew him closer and closer to the Lord. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It was so good. We yes. God put us there. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and it says that God directs our steps yes. and that's exactly what he did for you and Tom. Yep. And uh, was, I just think it's kind of fun to think, you know, we're talking about the tabernacle, but really the tabernacle is a representation, you know, of our bodies, our physical bodies. But in addition to that, the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies represents God, amen, heaven, amen. and how they do that because of all the color and you'll see going on. And the gold, the purity of the gold. And we know that heaven, heaven has streets of transparent gold. Yes. Yes. And from my studying, as I've looked at that, transparent gold is real. Yes. In gold's purest, purest form, it is transparent. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be walking on those streets of gold. And when we lose someone, you know, when we um, go to heaven... That's what we'll see. We get to rejoice with though with them and and though it's sad here on earth because we've lost so many, they're rejoicing with the Savior and they are walking the streets of gold and they don't have to worry about these wars and rumors of wars and you know the 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 injustice of of life here on the, in this planet. And yet God 
has a plan. Yeah, yeah. God has a plan. You know, we can be concerned about going down in the world, but then you know what? We have to put it all in God's hands yes. and know that it has to come to pass before yes. it's fulfilling His word. Lord. Yes, absolutely. It's it is, from the, it it is fulfilling His word. Yes, before He can come back. That's right. That's exactly correct. That's exactly correct. So even down to the um, points where it talks about um, in you know we're going to look at some things with in numbers. So even as they had this. Um, the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies all set up in Numbers 2, each tribe, and we're not going to really go in there, but each tribe, God has specifically given instructions for each tribe to take a side. And so on the east side was Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. And all of their total people was 186,400. On the south side was the tribe of Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. And that those three tribes equaled 151,450. On the west side was Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. And that equaled 108,100. On the north side was Dan, and Dan, Asher, and Naphtali equaled 100,000, 157,600. Now, think about all of those people. These are all the people that are walking in this, um, in the direction, in the desert with Moses. That's just the leaders of the tribe. And the, the men of the tribe there. I was going to do this real quick. Let's add this up and find out. Um, I should have done this before. 186. So you have over a half a million people yeah. that are surrounding the tabernacle. Now, it's interesting that they have this set up as a camp. And God specifically says, I want you to camp here. The word for camp is a word called makana, which means... Listen to this. This has kind of touched me in a very specific, special way today. Army, band, company, and station. The military term was given to the children of Israel, the army of the living God. It was several decades that would pass before Israelites faced a human foe. So they were not in this wilderness fighting an enemy. However... God gathered them up as an army, stationed them in the wilderness, and led them as a commander-in-chief. So here's a question for you. Why would God position them in the wilderness as a battalion on the battlefield with, con with the conspicuous absence of an enemy? Why do you think God would do that? To know that he's in command. To know that God, to teach them that God is in command. Right. Yes, absolutely. You know, as I was thinking about this, it was as if God was had placed them there as a boot camp. Yeah, in the wilderness. In the wilderness. They did not face the lot enemies there. However, there was one enemy they faced on a constant basis basis and that was the devil satan satan was a constant um he constantly led them you know we all are sinners and so if you have man you have sin <laughs> if you have woman you have sin that's just how it is 
But as we keep studying this, we see that the children of Israel were on the toughest battlefield of their nation's history. The most vicious enemy of all, she writes, themselves. And I was thinking about this and I thought, after all, it's our own self that can be the most devastating. It's when we satisfy the ways that we want. When we satisfy the things that we want to do. When we satisfy the flesh and well, the, fl the, the eyes, you oh, know. The flesh can't please God. We can't please God. No. And I really thought it was interesting. You know, the Lord used this time period in the wilderness as we've seen so many times with we've studied the scriptures over the um, last few years even we watched how Moses was in the desert um, Joseph had a desert time every single prophet was in the desert mm -hmm. even Noah had a wilderness time yeah. he was in the boat for 40 years, 40 days, he was in the boat. But in those 40 days, it lasted much longer than that. And so that was his wilderness. There's a specific wilderness that we go through. And it's not because God is mad at us. It's not because God um, wants to punish us. But it's because God wants to grow us. And when he grows us to become what he wants us to be, that's how we learn to come against spiritual warfare. Henry Buckaby um, says, in every generation, there seems to exist cliches used by the body of Christ. No doubt on the top of the list for this generation would be, I'm under attack. Every difficulty seems to be labeled. Well, it's all spiritual warfare. Without a question, we do fight wars in the heavenlies, but you can be sure it's spiritual, but can you be sure it's spiritual warfare? We must be able to answer these three ne questions negatively. Listen to the questions that Henry Beckaby, Blackaby has distinguished. Number one, am I living outside of the will of God? Because if you're living outside the will of God, then what you're doing is not going to go well. End of story. Your life will be a disaster. You have to be in God's will in order for um, things to go well. Number two, do I have unconfessed sin in my life? That is a matter. We might have something that we've forgotten about, but God doesn't judge that. God looks at our heart. Do we have a repentant attitude, a repented heart, a repented spirit? If we have that repented spirit, then again, we will not have to worry about, you know, the attack. Um, but if we have sin that we're clinging on to, we're maybe hiding, kind of hiding it in the corner, hiding it in the closet, and we pretend like nobody knows it, God still knows. God still knows that unconfessed sin. And we can pretend like it's not there. And we can hide it from other people, but we can't hide it from God. And so God is simply, um, and so then the third one is God simply working to complete me. So sometimes, again, to go back to the, the, um, the idea of gold, gold is purified by fire. Fire burns off the dross. When those burn up, they light on fire and they explode and go away. God does that in our lives to grow us to become the man and woman that we want to be, the man and woman that he wants us to be. And so we have to know those three things. Are we living in God's will? Do we have unconfessed sin? Or is God completing a task in our life? And if we, if we move away from those three things, certainly we can say, oh, yes, 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 yes. It's, it's all about, it's, this is all Satan. But if we're not walking in God's ways and we're not doing what God wants us to do and we're doing making bad choices, we're going to reap the consequences. Absolutely. Let's face it. There are consequences. If we smoke, we're going to have consequences to smoking. 
It's going to affect our body. It's going to affect our lungs. It's going to affect how we can breathe, how we can... It affects every aspect of our and body. And the people around us. And even the people around us. That's why secondhand smoke is so dangerous. Um, and so with that, I was thinking about that. We are at war. We're at war with an enemy. But we have to be careful to not just blame it on the enemy to satisfy our flesh. <laughs> and isn't that so easy? I mean, satisfying our flesh... Well, if we're satisfying our flesh, it's not really... It's please, can't please God. No. no. And I and I can hear um, Henry Blackaby thinking, you know, now if we did it, you know, during the 60s, there was that old phrase that, oh, the devil made me do it. If it feels good, do it. If it feels good, do it. Yeah. And those are, those are not true. Those are very dangerous. Those are lies that we just accepted because it's our own flesh and blood which could be twice as strong of an enemy in us than, the, <laughs> than what is in the world. Well, then we create our own spiritual warfare. Yes, like absolutely. Absolutely, we do. So we have, to, we have to identify, are we under attack from the devil or from our own flesh, from our own selfish desires? You know, today, one of the, the sayings <clears throat> um, Henry Blackaby would, would suggest is, listen, it's my way or the highway. You either do it my way or you get out. And a lot of times that's what happens. Well, when we're walking that way, God can't bless us because we're going to have consequences to those negative aspects in our life. Um, how do we know if we're at war? With ourself or with our, our um, at war with our flesh or our, because when we become at war with our flesh, sometimes our mind gets in the way. And so we have to have those all together. Well, Paul actually addresses that in Romans 7, 14 to 25. Let's look at Romans 7, 14 to 25. If you have that, go okay. ahead. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand mm. what I do, for what I want to do, uh, what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my spiritual nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This is this I keep on doing. Now, if I do not want, I do not want to. Now, if I do what I, what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the mm. numbers of my body, mm -hmm. waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Mm. Who will re rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then I myself in my mind am a slave to God, law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Okay. And so here, Paul is struggling. He doesn't want to sin, but he does sin. And he knows that the war is against flesh and blood. He fights. He fights for that. Um, and so he, he says, I love that he says, I do for what I do is not good. 
what I want to do. He wants to do good, but he doesn't. He ends up doing evil because sin is living in me, he says. Sin is living in me. And each and every one of us have sin living in us. Battle and we have to, the, flesh. the battle of the flesh, the battle of the mind. We have to be able to spiritually come against all of these ugly things that are taking place in us. So in our, in our book, it's talking about some different questions here. It says, describing the battling for ourselves. Read the verse. We just read it. Mark the following statements, true or false. Okay, so the first one. Often I do what I hate. Did Paul say that? True. Yes, it's true. Even when I do sin, even when I do good, sin or evil is present in me. True or false? True. True. In my flesh dwells no good thing. True. True. My inward person delights in God's law. True. True. Another law wars with my mind. True. Christ is the only one who can deliver us from our sin. Amen. Amen. Each of the above statements is true, as we just read in Romans. And those things that we know we are not alone in our in our fight. We are not alone in our fight. Um, God has knows the battle we're in. Jesus knows the battle we're in. He bore all of our sins on Calvary. And when he bore all our sins on Calvary and he died for our sins, he that's took, why he's sitting there interceding for us. Exactly. All. He's at the Father's yes. right hand interceding for us. He is he at the Father's right hand. Yes, is. that's right. Yeah. That's right. And so that makes a difference. So what does God ask of us? He asks in Deuteronomy 10. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 10, 12 to 18. I know we're flipping around here, but these are just such strong, strong scriptures. 10, 12 to 18. And I'll get, I'll read that one. Okay, it says, for now, um, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear that the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God. Listen how it says to serve the Lord. With all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you to do for your very own good. Why are we doing it? We're doing it for our good. We are doing it for our good so that we can become better. And that's why it's important to follow the law. Um, and I was reading and just the scripture just kind of fleeted away. Um, it says that when we follow God's law, we will be at peace. Why is there so little peace in the world? Because they're not following God's law. When we don't follow God's law, we will have unrest. We will not be peaceful. Deuteronomy eleven thirteen. <clears throat> it says, so if you are faithful to obey the command I am giving you today to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. Then I will send rain on your land and seasons, both autumn and spring rains, so that you may gather in your grain, new wine and old. I will provide grass in the fields for your cattle and you will eat and be satisfied. So why did I read that scripture? Because it says, so if you faithfully obey my commands I, that I am giving you today to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, that's the turning point in our lives. When we begin loving God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, God's promises will come to pass in our lives. What is God's promise? What is God's promise to the Israelites was that he would walk with them. He would camp with them. He would be with them. God is with us all the time. And God blessed the children of Israel. He blessed them not only with um, 
the safety and, and the promised land after they get out. We'll see later. But he blessed them with peace and he blessed them with strength. And he is still blessing them today. Most, um, God is still blessing them today. They are his chosen people. And that's one of the reasons why we need to really, really be praying for Israel. Praying against this war that's taking place right now. Because Satan is always out to try to steal, kill, and destroy. It seems like he's really been out for a long time to destroy Israel. Look at the Jews in during World War II. Who did they take? They took the Jewish nation. And they and, and you know, Hitler tried to eliminate them numerous times, even during the time of Moses. All of the sons were supposed to be killed except Moses. Moses was not killed. He was protected. God will protect his children. He will protect us. But we still have to follow God's commands and God's will in our lives. And that's, you know, that's why we're doing this study. Because when we study and we know what is our heart, our heart is God's dwelling place. God was taken Israel and he put them in Israel and he led them through the desert. He led them in the wilderness for 40 years and 40, night, 40 years. And when he did that, he walked with them every step of the day, every step of the night. He was with them. He would lead them to stop, lead them to go, just provided food. He's Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha. And when he did all of that, God's power prevails. And that is what we have. It's not just about the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. It's what we have today. God is faithful. When we obey him, God is faithful faithful in our lives and so I just want to encourage you today that if you have not if you are struggling and have no peace and have um, just anxiety and, and issues that you can't seem to put your finger on talk to God about it because God is the answer to your, what you're seeking today let's pray Lord Jesus, we just thank you and we praise you for you are worthy, so worthy to be praised. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, thank you that you died on the sin, on the cross for my sin, yes. that I could be free. You who knew no sin became the sin mm -hmm. of us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus, that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And we thank you and we praise you in your holy, holy name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great day.